We're going to start today with a retirement application of differential equations of all things, applying ideas with differential equations to your retirement. When you retire many years from now, I would suggest aiming to have at least maybe three or four million dollars saved, and I'm not kidding. I, being older, am not near that, but I'm trying to get to two million at least. I think with inflation in the future and also with Social Security being even less sure 30, 40 years down the line here, you should probably try to have three or four million dollars saved. But just to keep things simple, let's pretend you have a million dollars saved. You have $1 million saved, just to use a nice round number. It's saved. The question is, how much uh, can you withdraw per year so that you don't run out of money? Now, that question depends on many things besides having a million dollars. It depends on your cost of living. How much money do you spend? It depends on uh, inflation. It depends on how long you live. It depends on where you have your money invested. To keep things simple again, Assume it's in a savings account, even though, well, you wouldn't really want to do this. You really wouldn't want to keep all your money in a savings account. It's just not enough with interest. But just for the sake of simplicity, the savings account offers an interest rate, an annual interest rate of R, where R might be 0 0.04 or 0 0.05 or whatever compounded continuously, giving you interest every second of every day. Now, no bank actually does that. I mean, if you've got your money invested widely in the stock market, maybe worldwide, and at every moment of every day, some stock market exchange is open, then you could imagine you're getting interest every second of every day. But if it's just one savings account, you would not be. But just for the sake of simplicity and to allow us to use differential equations more simply, we're going to go ahead and make that assumption. Okay, again, simplifying assumptions are what's going on here. Let's also assume you're withdrawing here certain amount per year. Now, of course, that could be once a year. It could be once a quarter. More realistically, it might be once a month or maybe even once a week. But also to keep things simple and use differential equations with regard to your withdrawals, we're going to assume continuous with withdrawals. If that ended up meaning you withdrew money at a rate of $1,000 per year, leveling, level withdrawal, meaning the money that's coming into your bank account or that you're withdrawing is the same every second of every day. It's kind of funny calling it a savings account because where are you going to deposit? I guess in your checking account. But I mean, with your savings account, you could have a debit card as well. If you were withdrawing money at a rate of $100,000 a year, that much, right there, how much money would that be every second? We saw if Elon Musk gave you a billion dollars over the course of a year, deposited every second of every day, it was 30 something dollars every second. How much is $100,000 over the course of a year every second? Well, on average, that's how much it is every day. Divide by 365.25 then how much every hour, about $11.41 every hour, divide by 60, 19 cents every minute, divide by 60 again, about, about close to one third of one cent every second, or one cent every three seconds or so. 
is the rate that money would need to be coming into your account or you'd be need to be to withdraw from that savings account, say to your checking account, to have it be a continuous withdrawal rate of $100,000 every year. But I hope that seems like that's probably too much to withdraw. You're probably going to withdraw it at a rate less than $100,000 a year. How could we figure out what's the best rate to withdraw it at? We need a differential equation. Let's let capital A be the amount of money in the savings account at time t. At time t, what would make the most sense to use for t? Well, since r is an annual interest rate, and also since we're withdrawing this a certain constant amount per year continuously, it would make sense to say t is in years. It would also make sense to say the amount is in dollars. That's the amount of money. How do we write down a differential equation? Giving us the rate of change of that money with respect to time. Here's a general principle that works when you've got, say, money growing and money being taken out is you do rate in minus rate out. Rate in for this example comes from interest. I mean, it could result from you making deposits. And to tell you the truth, there's nothing stopping you even after you've retired from making deposits if you want to. But then you might have less to spend on food. Okay, so there's nothing stopping you from doing that. That's how the money comes into the savings account from interest and maybe deposits. It's going to come out with withdrawals. The rate in, if you just assume it comes from interest and no deposits, is exponential growth. A constant times A. Call the constant R. Well, it would be the interest rate, actually. If it is a con compounded continuously, that does end up being what R is, which is part of the reason why we like continuous compounding. What's the rate out? It's at a constant rate in dollars per year, level constant rate. For example, it could be $100,000 per year, which again, converted to one cent every three seconds or so. But the units are thousand are dollars per year. I haven't said what it is. Let's give it a parameter name. Call this rate W for withdrawal dollars per year. If W is the withdrawal rate in dollars per year, we would subtract W. The units do work out right. The units for the ADT would be dollars per year. The units for A are dollars. What about the units for R? They are actually one over years. Maybe you've never thought of it that way, but you can think of the interest rate as being units of one over years. Now, if, if you think in terms of percent, you could also think of it as percent per year, but realize the word percent really means per hundred. Cent is related to 100. So when you write 4%, that's why you automatically say that's the same as 0 0.04, four one hundredths. The percent is just a label for out of 100. You could say it's a percent per year. You could think of this as in being one over years, giving you a product that is in dollars per year. And the withdrawal rate is in dollars per year as well. Once again, if it were $100,000 per year coming into your account continuously, that would translate to about one penny every three seconds. But you'd write 100,000 there if that's the case. So there's your differential equation. 
What's your initial condition? Well, if you have a million dollars, it would be A of zero is a million. But just to give ourselves a little bit more power, problem solving power, let's not specify what it is other than calling it A naught. And there is my IVP, the differential equation with the initial condition. Yes, if you got a million dollars, A naught is a million. But let's see if we can solve it in this more general setting without specifying A naught. How? Separate variables. Does separation of variables always work? No. It just has worked in all the examples we've done so far. We will do one example today where it doesn't always work and we'll have Mathematica solve it for us. But here, it does work. Realize the variables are T and A, not R and W. Also not A naught. Those are all fixed constants. Look at that differential equation, the equality between these two things. I'd like to get all the A's on the left and all the T's on the right. I can quote unquote multiply both sides by DT to cancel over there. Have a DT over here and then divide both sides by RA minus W. Do not subtract RA from both sides before you, for example, multiply by T. It just runs in, into trouble. Divide by this whole thing. So that means after separation of variables, you get the equation dA over RA minus W equals dT. Start getting an itch that you want to scratch here. The scratching well isn't doing this, but instead is integrating. There, that feels better. And then you actually integrate. On the right, you get T plus a constant. On the left, you get something plus a constant, but the constant can be moved to the right. Uh, it's a little tricky. After a little bit of guessing, you should be able to guess one over R ln of the absolute value of R A minus W. And yeah, I'll just put the constant on the right and I'll call it C1. We need that one over R there because when you differentiate this thing, you also, also have to use the chain rule and the derivative of the inside function with respect to A is R, so you multiply by a factor of R and that's got to cancel with the one over R so that you differentiate to one over R A minus W. You could also do a substitution. Oh, I'm already using letter W. Okay, U equals R A minus W. D would, D U would be R D A. And D A would be one over R D U. You'd get a one over R. Always remember, you're trying to solve for the dependent variable, in this case, A. Multiply both sides by R. I mean, we could use a property of logarithms to bring that one over R into this power, but that seems not so pleasant. It seems more pleasant to multiply both sides by R. I'll write C2. C2 really represents R times C1, but since C1 is arbitrary, C2 would also be arbitrary. Exponentiate to get rid of the logarithm. We'll get the absolute value of RA minus W is e to the C2, e to the RT, which I'll write as C3 e to the RT, or C3 is e to the C2. And then we can pseudo justify getting rid of the absolute value signs by saying, hey, C3 has got to be positive, but if I write, say, C4, that could be positive or negative. Actually, that's the first time I've used a C4. Why not just call it C? It's because I'm going to do a couple other things before I have my final C. I'm going to now add W to both sides. RA is W plus C4 e to the RT. Then I'm going to divide both sides by R. A is a function of t, which I'll call phi of t is w over r plus, now I'll just call it c, e to the rt. Here, c2 is really um, r c1. You could say c3 is e to the c2. 
you could say C3 is also the absolute value C4. And then I guess C is C4 divided by R. I'm writing all that. You don't have to. Just to remind you or make specific what I'm doing here. There's a general solution. Let's solve the generic initial value problem where A0 is not specified. I have not used an A0 yet. I'm about to. And then, in fact, the fee function, I will even label with the subscript. That is the initial condition. A0 is going to be phi of 0. We plug in t equals 0. You get w over r plus c e to the 0. e to the 0 is 1. This all becomes w over r plus c. Solve for C, C will be A naught minus W over R. Or if you get a common denominator of R, that's the same as uh, R times A naught minus W all over R. And therefore, A is phi of T. And now I'm going to use a subscript, phi sub A naught of T, to emphasize what the initial condition is. I will explain why maybe on Friday that I do that. Look here, replace C with this fraction. Replace C with R times A naught minus W over R e to the RT. Lots and lots of letters. But you can handle it. You can do this. Now think, think about this. What was our goal again? Our goal was to figure out how much can we withdraw per year at a continuous rate so that we don't run out of money. Is that possible to figure out from this formula? It is, but you have to think about it carefully. I think it's probably helpful to draw a graph, or I should say graphs, of the amount as a function of t. Think here with me. What we have here is a constant W over R plus another constant times E to the RT, where R is positive. E to the RT is exponential growth, not exponential decay. A constant plus another constant times E to the RT, if th that constant is positive, is going to be, yeah, truly exponential growth, shifted up by that much. If this is W over R, And that coefficient there is positive, which it will be if A naught is bigger than W over R. This is an R here. This coefficient is going to be positive when A naught is bigger than W over R. Think about that. Um, where does this, first of all, where does this equal zero? R A naught minus W over R equals zero if and only if R A naught minus W is zero, the numerator, if and only if R A naught equals W, or if you prefer, A naught is W over R. That's the value of the initial amount that makes that term zero, meaning if that's your initial amount, W over R, your amount of money stays steady. It's an equilibrium solution. Equilibrium solution. Now, in reality, you'd probably think about this equation instead. And that equation is actually giving us the answer for that we were after, the withdrawal rate, to guarantee we don't run out of money. If you know what A0 is, like a million, and you know the interest rate, like 0 0.08. Multiply them to figure out your withdrawal rate. A million times 0 0.08. Your withdrawal rate is $80,000 a year to keep your money level. You won't run out of money. Again, $100,000 a year was about one penny every three seconds. 
How much is this? $219 a day, $9.13 an hour, about 15 cents a minute. This is about one cent every four seconds. Close to a quarter of a cent every second. If W is that, you're going to stay at equilibrium. If it's truly continuous interest and continuous withdrawals. Now, reality, of course, real life, you're not getting the interest every second of every day. You're not withdrawing money every second of every day in all likelihood. You've got discrete interest deposits and withdrawals. And so in reality, your A function would change a little bit, but it would basically stay steady. If A naught is bigger than W over R, then the graph's uh, increasing and concave up. This is when A naught is bigger than W over R. You get graphs like this. Exponential growth, in fact, shifted upward by a million, say. On the other hand, if A naught is less than W over R, then your money's going to go to zero. This is equivalent to W being less than R times A naught. And this one is equivalent to W being greater than R times A naught. When you withdraw money slowly, your money grows. When you draw money too fast, your money decays. The boundary, again, is when you get equality. W is R times A naught. So an equilibrium solution, is it stable or unstable? It's, un it's unstable. The other solutions are moving away as T increases. It's an unstable equilibrium solution. It's very sensitive to what your starting amount is, what A naught is. Just barely bigger than W over R, it grows. Just barely less, it decays to zero. You, you run out of money. That's not stable. That's unstable. The fact that it's unstable can also be thought about purely in terms of the differential equation without actually even solving it. There's the differential equation again. If I think of the right-hand side as a function of the dependent variable A, call it F of A. Remember, we did this when we wanted to think about drawing the slope field. F, this right-hand side of the differential equation, help us figure out the slopes of the marks in the slope field. The equilibrium solution is where those marks have slope of zero. So by setting this equal to zero, and solving for A, I can find the equilibrium solution. Solve for A, solve for A, I get A is W over R, which I already knew was the equilibrium. Just reconfirming what I already knew, but that's a lot quicker. I didn't have to solve the differential equation. Also, the fact that the derivative of this function, this linear function of A is the constant R, which is positive, is a reason why this is an unstable equilibrium solution. I'll let you think about why if you want. The derivative of this F function is R, which is positive. That is a, a reason why this is unstable. Again, in real life, there are complications. Withdrawals and interest at discrete times there's also the fact that in all likelihood, if your money's deposited, you know, in part in the stock market, the interest rate is not going to be constant. The stock market goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down with lots of jaggedness in between. Over time, over the long run, it goes up. I think you might say at an average rate of return of 8% per year, but yeah, it's this is this is not really reality. It's a it's a caricature of reality, but I think it's still worthwhile in terms of giving you a withdrawal rate that is well 
don't take out any more than that at least. Play it safe by taking out less. Now you, you may be forced by circumstances to not be able to take out less. Maybe you have to take out that amount or more, but then just realize you may run out of money, which is part of the reason why people buy annuities is so that they never run out of money. Whether it's a good deal or not depends on how long you live. Annuities are good deals to buy when you retire. Uh, they pay you until you die. They can even pay your spouse until they die. They're good deals as long as you live a long time. They're not such a good deal if you don't live very long. 